Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, which is focused on exercise and Parkinson's disease. And as usual, I want to thank the people who've made this webinar possible, or the organizations, perhaps. It's the Cure Parkinson's Trust, it's the Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and it's Parkinson's Movement. And I'm very happy to tell you that we have three distinguished panelists today who all represent a huge body of knowledge. And uh, I'm going to introduce, introduce you to them briefly and you'll be able to say hello and see them. The person who is speaking in the webinar is the one you will see on your screen. And uh, that person will of course shift as we go along. Uh, I'd also like to say before I introduce our speakers or our, our panelists, we are not giving talks, uh, that anyone who's listening in is welcome to ask us questions during the webinar. We already have a large number of questions. I'm holding two sheets of paper here, uh, some of which have been submitted by people who registered. But we'll try to look at those questions. You can find a little window in the, uh, in the conference um, portal where you can go and uh, do Q&A. So you type in your question. And um, let me start then by introducing Dr. Karen Raphael to you. So Karen really has three roles, I think, in this webinar. She is a medical researcher at NYU in New York. Karen is also a person affected by Parkinson's disease. But finally, Karen is a person who practices uh, intense exercise. So hello, Karen, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I guess I don't have to introduce myself since you introduced me so well, Patrick. So thank you. Yeah, but uh, I, I am a, a clinical behavioral epidemiologist and uh, psychologist, actually, and uh, had Parkinson's for 10 years and am doing great. And I can't tell you as an N of one whether it's due to my intensive exercise regimen, but uh, I feel a lot better than I think I would have otherwise. That's all I can say. And we can get to that later. Thank you. So our second panelist is Dr. Michael Jakovic, who is at the University of Southern California and a different time zone to us. And uh, Michael, you are a neuroscientist who tries to understand the mechanisms that underlie changes in the brain uh, that are associated with exercise. Hello, yeah, Michael. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thank you uh, to, for the invitation. And, and uh, I hope the participants uh, get something out of this. And, and uh, we put uh, a number of papers online and, and uh, look forward to your questions. And I think we'd be helpful because our job really is for the patients. And I don't really care, give a rat's ass about a rat, but uh, we try to translate what we do in the lab to impact humans. So we've started on this, in this field about two, 2002 when we ran our first mouse on a treadmill and looked at neuroplasticity and saw, oh my God, things are different than we had actually thought. My training is molecular biology and biophysics um, and really gene protein expression, microscopy, things of that nature. And unfortunately I got pulled into the translational world and with my colleague, uh, Dr. Giselle Petzinger, uh, have been really pushing, translating these findings into clinical practice and especially community uh, impact. So thank you for, for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you. And finally, our third participant is Dr. Bastian Bloom, who's from the Netherlands. He's a clinical neurologist with a long-standing and great interest in exercise and management of Parkinson's disease. And might I add, he has just become co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease. So welcome, Bas. Thank you, Patrick. I'll be very brief because I'm keen to move on to the questions. I'm a doctor, also a former elite volleyball player, played for the Dutch national volleyball team, all thanks to my height, I'm 6'8", and I combine my two passions, exercise on the one hand and creating a better life for people with Parkinson's now into studies, into exercise for people with Parkinson's. So, great. So let me start with a first short question, really. Can you all together help me define what types of exercise exist? You know, what are the differences in terms of of the intensity or endurance or using complex thinking to perform the tasks. If you could just give a broad overview, which will lay the ground for our discussions. Karen. All right, well, I mean, generally, when we think about exercise, we think about, I mean, the, there, there, there are different ways we can categorize it, mostly in terms of um, the amount of 
effort that we put toward it, uh, which is traditionally one thinks of, uh, you know, uh, the traditional the traditional methods are we, we look at uh, heart rate um, and we, this is again very traditional view, uh, and we consider what is an aerobic training zone in relationship to our maximum heart rate, which is calculated by uh, 220 minus our age as our max heart rate. And then we talk about an aerobic zone and an anaerobic zone where our heart rate is getting more and more intense um, and higher. And in theory, we should not be able to uh, go higher than our maximum heart rate. But that, that, you know, there's been a lot of critique about this kind of uh, view of exercise intensity. But there is, I would say, and, and you know, others can comment, a view that one com important component, and just one important component, may be the intensity of exercise. But of course, there are many different types of exercise. I mean, it, when I started off um, 10 years ago, it, you know, it, you, we were sort of coming from that perspective of uh, it's physical therapy. And then, uh, and then, then I was reading, as I do when I, whenever any health condition comes up, you start seeing the basic science and then and that rats running on the treadmill. And so uh, I thank you um, to uh, Dr. Jakovic, who's here. Who's here. Um, that was really helpful for me, but a lot of the work has been done in, um, you, you, could, you could talk about um, really uh, aerobic exercise and different intensities of aerobic exercise. So, so Michael, I know when we talked uh, just before we started the webinar, you also have an interest not just in the intensity of the exercise, but also the complexity of the task. And you think that might be an important factor when one discusses the effects of exercise. Oh, with, without question, we, we know complexity is very important. And what we mean by complexity is, is the challenge that you receive in the type of exercise you receive. So um, Karen is, is correct in the, in the idea that intensity is extremely important, but so is the complexity of the exercise, which means to make it simple from a patient point of view, the type of exercise you should engage in is a form of exercise that is a learning modality that in which you break a sweat. So if you're learning tennis, if you're learning trail running, make them learning modalities. And what that says as an overall statement that we have evidence from animal models as well as targeting in humans and looking at imaging is that you want the type of exercise, break a sweat, but also be cognitively engaging such that you have to think about what you're doing. Try to think of when you, try, when you were very young learning new types of skills. It's a skill acquisition process because what we're trying to do is to change brain connections. And we're trying to target specifically connections within the brain that are specific to Parkinson's disease. Motor and cognitive are the two circuits. You think of the frontal cortex to the basal ganglia. We can actually target that with types of exercise. So again, last thing, it doesn't matter the type of exercise. The exercise should be a learning modality, be complex and intense, meaning you break a sweat. So thank you. So we may come back to those things as we discuss the specific studies uh, during this webinar. But before we dive into many detailed questions, I'd also like to set the stage of the different types of effects that exercise might have in Parkinson's. One could imagine that it affects the risk of developing Parkinson's disease, so exercise during your lifetime before you're diagnosed. One can also imagine that exercise will affect the symptoms of somebody who already has Parkinson's disease. And finally, uh, one could imagine that exercise would modify the rate of progression of the disease. And we will focus on the latter two. So how can exercise modify symptoms or possibly affect rate of progression? But I'd like to ask Bass a little bit, what do we know about lifetime risk and being a volleyball player in your youth? Yes, there is some epidemiological work to suggest that um, engaging in regular exercise while you are still healthy is associated, and I'm using the word associated purposely, with a lower risk of future development of Parkinson's disease. That is not to say per se that it was the exercise that protected against Parkinson's disease. It might be that people were exercising more for a variety of other reasons, but there is this association. 
to my mind, uh, there's two important things. One is people listening who already have Parkinson's should not blame themselves for not having exercised enough in their life. You're not to blame for your Parkinson's. For all we know is it's bad luck. Uh, and don't blame yourself. I think those data from uh, the era before people developed Parkinson's is, should only be seen as an encouragement to engage in exercise today while you have the disease. I'm a strong believer. This is probably why you invited me to be on this panel. Um, so um, there is a tight link between exercise and Parkinson's. But again, people should not think that not having exercised in their life was, was, was the cause of their Parkinson's. And Karen, do you want to challenge that question about whether exercise can affect the symptoms of the disease? Well, in terms of the symptoms of the disease, again, I am an N of one. And as a researcher, I cannot not say that what my, whether my experience is generalizable, all right? Uh, I am one of those individuals who, uh, first of all, was uh, very physically active all my adult life, never an athlete, okay? not natural athlete, but became all my adult life was always engaged in weight training and running and everything. My dad had Parkinson's. I have probably a genetic risk for Parkinson's. So again, as Boss was saying, you know, don't blame yourself, even if you are terribly active and you get Parkinson's, all right? Um, in fact, my symptoms first occurred when I was trekking to Everest Base Camp. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe it was also had a little bit to do with uh, uh, lack of oxygen at the high altitude, but that's another story. But I found that over the past 10 years, um, when, when I was first diagnosed, um, the person that I chose, and in New York City, where I'm from, as you've up in the background, uh, I chose because she said, there's no such thing as too much exercise. I took it very literally um, and took what was already a fairly high level of activity and raised it up quite a bit. Uh, we won't even tell you how much. Uh, well, maybe I'll ask. But, uh, I will ask. How much do you okay. exercise per day? Well, well let's see. It, well, today be, I was a little bit shorter than usual for complicated reasons, but I, I ran about 10 miles this morning and I do exercise seven days a week. Um, and I will say that after about, and I, I was on meds right away because I was actually uh, needed to be med on meds right away and um, found that after about two years, it seemed like I wasn't having the offs that I was having and was able to gradually decrease my medication over time. That, and, you know, uh, and I also had the experience of if I was in, in it, like an expedition boat or something like that, where there wasn't a running track, um, if I went for more than two days without exercise, I could feel a return of symptoms. That's so interesting. In I actually just had a question, uh, Karen, from somebody called Jane Rideout. Can you find that your symptoms get worse if you stop intensive exercise for a short time? And you answered that question. Yes. Yes, well, that, that I, I, I've had that experience. I don't know whether that's been documented in the literature in terms of, you know, people talk about, you know, in terms of neuroprotection, you might look three months out or something like that. But I have found that in terms of my own life where I exercise seven days a week, so I have no excuse of what's my day off. Um, I have found that if I go really more than 48 hours, I can start to feel symptoms returning. The you described yourself as an N of one study. It's you only. And uh, maybe Bass can fill in a little bit about studies where people have applied <laughs> exercise in large groups of patients and had controls. And what are the outcomes of those? Yes. So I think the good news for all the folks uh, listening uh, and watching us is that there is now good evidence to support the merits of regular exercise as a symptomatic treatment, just like a drug to suppress the symptoms of your disease. That evidence is strongest for the so-called motor symptoms, like the stiffness and the slowness and maybe the tremor. Uh, problems such as the walking and your balance are probably harder to suppress or improve with regular exercise. But the motor symptoms, the evidence is best. We have a strong suspicion and hope and feeling 
that issues such as sleep, constipation, slow bowel movements, uh, your mood, depression can also improve with regular exercise. The scientific evidence is a bit weaker there, but I think the evidence is now as strong as it is for certain drugs. And in fact, we published a recent trial some two and a half months ago to show that engaging in exercise, in this case on a stationary bicycle at home, three times a week for 30 to 45 minutes had an effect that was as large as adding an extra drug to your levodopa dose. So that should really encourage people to uh, engage in regular exercise for at least uh, three times a week. The one thing that I wanted to add, in addition to the question that was raised by one of our viewers today about feeling worse after you stop exercise, the one thing that I wanted to mention to everybody listening is it is not uncommon for people with Parkinson's to temporarily feel a bit worse immediately after exercise which in fact makes perfect sense because you've consumed all of your dopamine to engage in exercise. And some people take that as evidence that they should maybe not better not exercise. Please don't. If you feel more fatigued, maybe even more tremulous or slower immediately after exercise, that is okay. It means you've done a proper exercise. It's not harmful. In fact, we think it is a trigger for your own body and your own brain to build up more motor reserve. Um, and what I do recommend to many people is maybe take some extra medication just prior to your exercise than you would do on other days where you do not exercise. My brain does it. So why doesn't your brain do it? So can you describe how you do a study where you look at the effects of exercise <clears throat> and symptoms? Because of course, there's the challenge with any scientific study in Parkinson's disease that there is a significant placebo effect and maybe you can explain what I mean by placebo. How can you get the control people to not uh, do as well simply because they don't have the placebo effect? Yeah. <clears throat> so the placebo effect means that somebody receives an intervention that is actually not um, efficacious or maybe not terribly efficacious but people think it is doing something good and they will improve. And the one thing that, one of the many miracles that surround Parkinson's is that it is the one condition on the planet that is extremely sensitive to these placebo effects. Um, and you're right, it is very hard to, uh, to blind people um, so that they do not know whether they receive a real intervention or a, what people tend to call a fake intervention. Our study that we published in the Lancet Neurology three months ago was unique in that regard because we asked people in the control group to do stretching exercises. And stretching is not bad. Uh, and we told people beforehand that they were both getting a real intervention, which was true, we weren't lying, um, but we were comparing two different types of interventions. It was, as you, you may call this an active control group. Mm -hmm. And both groups received an app that motivated people to faithfully comply with the exercise regime that we prescribed. Everybody knows exercise is good, but nobody sticks to it. So we used a clever app that motivated people. We gave them anticipated rewards. If you will exercise now, your husband will fix the roof, something you've always wanted. And we did that both in the stretching group and in the real exercise group, which was cycling on a stationary bicycle. And it was the first study in the world where after the study, when we debriefed the subjects, they both felt they got the real deal. So and the roofs perfect... were fixed. And all the roofs were fixed, yes. So I see in Karen, you raised your hand. I think you wanted to comment on something that Bass said, and I'm just going to let everybody know, after Karen, Michael is gonna describe what sorts of mechanisms might be at play in the brain when people with Parkinson's exercise. But Karen, what was your idea here? Yeah, I, I just, I, I reacted to something Bas said as a methodologist, and uh, just so that when people think of placebo, it's not that it's not real, particularly in, 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 in Parkinson's and my area of research, which is pain. These are the two areas in which there are powerful placebo effects. All right, we know we can produce dopamine in response to a, a, a treatment which is not specifically intended to target it. And uh, coming out of pain research, uh, where a lot of the work on placebo started, uh, we know that uh, at least one component of that is a learned response. 
Okay, we are, it's in expectancy, but it, it translates into a sort of a cla from a classical uh, conditioning model. Like when you take a pill, you expect, and your body expects that you're gonna start to feel better. Um, so I guess that was the one thing that I wanted to comment on. And I do think that it's really important uh, when people do have active placebos, uh, so pleased that Boss was able to say that uh, participants all felt like they were getting the best treatment because in a lot of clinical trials, they may have a placebo treatment, but they don't necessarily test that all the participants thought the groups were equally efficacious and, and there can be actually a demoralization that could result uh, from a group that feels like they're getting an inferior treatment. So that's something that has to be looked at. Uh, that's a very good point. And I think it illustrates one of the main challenges with trials in Parkinson's disease, having an appropriate placebo arm. Somebody asked you a question before I go to Michael just now, Karen. Rochelle Flanagan said, is there any better time to train taking into account medication timings or circadian rhythms? Do you have any views on this? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. well, um, it gets into a whole other topic. I train in fasting conditions. So, and that is controversial. And I train, you know, I can, I can work out for three hours in the morning. And then I have so to before work. breakfast. So before breakfast, and I stop eating by seven o'clock the evening before, and it gets into the whole issue of, of uh, you know, uh, mild ketosis, and you know, I don't have a, a, a scientifically informed opinion about that. Maybe you folks do, but all I know is that I have an incredible amount of energy and an empty stomach. I cannot exercise with great intensity if I have anything in my GI tract. So, and it, it, and, and it gets your GI tract moving really well, as you mentioned. Uh, so uh, circadian rhythms, it actually is very good at resetting one's circadian rhythms. I think there's some evidence that uh, suggests that uh, one of the best things one can do when traveling internationally, if you regularly exercise is to, uh, you know, at the time that you would usually exercise in your home time zone, that equivalent in your new time zone, exercise then, and it will sort of reset your internal clock. So Michael, I yeah. said you were gonna tell us a little bit about mechanism. So we've heard here that exercise can affect people with Parkinson's disease and improve their lives. What sort of mechanisms are at play inside the brain? And I know you've primarily studied this in animals because that's where it's easiest to study. Can you tell us in broad sweeping terms what sorts of things happen in the brain when an animal exercises? Yeah, animal and also we've been, we've been gathering information from humans. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's uh, indirect, but we've been able to do that with imaging and also some other aspects. Um, Karen, and I see a couple of questions uh, uh, bring up uh, uh, aspects of the mechanisms. One that's interesting is one uh, viewer asks, whether exercise changes dopamine levels in the brain. We used to think that. And then in 2007, we published a paper that showed that under the conditions of exercise, there is no change in the amount of dopamine in the brain of an animal that's exercising in several models of Parkinson's disease. And that was against the grain and we took a lot of heat for that. So what we then discovered is that it's not the amount of dopamine that changes, it's how you handle the dopamine. And I think Karen just pointed that out also. Dopamine handling under conditions of exercise is very different than under sedentary conditions. And we see that in our animal models. For example, what happens is that the evoked release, the amount of dopamine that you release from the brain in those circuits that are being engaged by the exercise are elevated. There's also the uptake, which we call synaptic occupancy. The amount of dopamine that stays in the synapse stays there longer under conditions of exercise because exercise actually downregulates the transporter that sponges up the, pro, the, the sponges up the dopamine that's in the synapse. So that's another mechanism. So the, the amount of dopamine doesn't change. How you use it changes dramatically. The other thing that changes quite dramatically are other circuits become engaged. And the most important circuit that we stumbled upon by just searching, graduate students just searching for things that change, is the cortical striatal 
uh, pathway, which means the cortex, the thinking part of the brain into the basal ganglia changes dramatically in terms of its activity. And it's aberrant in Parkinson's and it's actually normalized with exercise, which says to us that there's actually another mechanism of using other circuits that are altered in the context of exercise. So basically, this is what you're doing. You're exercising, you're driving motor circuits, you're driving the brain, and the brain begins to think, how can I respond to this new types of environmental changes that I can then maintain? This is learning. This is how the brain learns. This is what the brain does and has been doing for millions and millions of years. And so it will then respond to that and actually find a new way to solve a problem of motor learning that is different than before it had disease. And we have a ton of evidence of that. And this is what we believe is happening. And we've got imaging in the human that says this. And actually, John Stossel's group just published a paper in Movement Disorders a few weeks ago that exactly shows that under conditions of exercise, dopamine handling is very different in the brain of a Parkinson's patient, something we showed almost 20 years ago um, in animal models. And I thank John for, for supporting that. D2 receptor is another one. The D2 receptor, one of the dopamine receptors, changes in its expression. And we know that it's important for cognition. It's important for executive function. It's important for a number of thinking aspects that link thinking to motor. And in fact, it's elevated. And so there's a restoration of that circuitry, not because of dopamine levels, but how we use dopamine and the, some of the underlying molecular mechanisms that are responsible for that. And the last point I want to make under mechanism is that we are spending a lot of time looking at the energetic changes. And Karen touched upon this without anybody knowing. She talked about fasting, the ketogenic diet, and exercise. From a neuron point of view, from a glia point of view, which is the other cells that exist within the human brain that we know are as important as neurons, under conditions of exercise, there's an energetic demand. When you have an energetic demand, your neurons and your astrocytes respond to that and what we call neuroplasticity and change their connections in terms of strength or numbers. So when you fast, the brain realizes that there's an energy demand. When you go into the ketogenic diet, you know there's an alteration in energetic demand. Exercise does the same thing. And in fact, the neuron can't distinguish between fasting, ketogenesis, and exercise because from a molecular point of view, the mitochondria, the neuron cells see the same thing. So what's happening is that they're being driven so in terms of the molecular mechanisms, it's sort of like a, the, the brain is almost like a muscle that you're, you're training and you're using those types of circuits to activate. And the other point that I want to make, the last thing before, before um, Patrick cuts me off, is that, is that these effects of exercise are circuit specific. There is no magic pixie dust that exists, and we often think of BDNF as one of them, it is not a pixie dust that we sprinkle into the brain and cause the brain to repair itself because the human brain does not know what type of connections to make until it's told to do that. This is called learning. This is how we learn to walk and talk and think. This is evolution. This is 10 million years of evolution. So what that means is that when we have Parkinson's patients who have motor and cognitive issues, we develop types of interventions, exercise that is cognitively in challenge, challenging using neuro PT, neurophysical therapy approaches to activate those circuits that we want repaired in terms of reversing the, 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 the symptomology. It is not the cure. I am never, never, pra never pro propagating a cure. It changes symptomology for these mechanisms. We don't know what, what causes Parkinson's. We don't know why it continues. Some of our best patients who got the best benefit from exercise, the disease progressed, but we believe that it is progressing and modified in a different form. And there's a couple of papers I posted last point is that in models of other degenerative disease, we can actually modify disease progression based on exercise in these models and showing that the course of disease is very different. And there is some studies in humans that kind of touch upon that. But again, it may modify disease progression in some fashion. And some of the guys that I do LA, you know, the LA Marathon with, they've had Parkinson's for 35 years and they're still running the marathon. We, we cut down to half, half marathon since we're all you know, getting older, but we, they, they still get the benefits from that. So those are some of the underlying mechanisms and we're getting a really good understanding from animal models as to what these mechanisms are. And we can now translate those into humans and, and understanding better what's going on in the human condition. Thank you, Michael. So that's a great overview. And I, uh, I will, uh, I think, sedge way over to this idea that exercise might affect disease progression because that's what you were hinting 
towards the end, but I'll also try to summarize the, the five key points, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you said there were five sort of areas where, where exercise does something in the brain in Parkinson's disease or animals that are models of Parkinson's. One is how dopamine itself is handled. That's the transmitter in the cells that are most affected in Parkinson's. The second thing is how the dopamine receptors perform, the ones that are receiving the signal or, or responding to dopamine. The third one is that other brain circuits that are involved in motor function or other functions that are important for, for motor function, uh, they will be engaged better. Then fourth, the supporting cells, the glial cells, will respond to changes in metabolism in a potentially beneficial way. And perhaps fifth, that there are growth factors that could be involved in this mix, either performing or triggering some of these responses or or actually themselves doing other things to the cells as, such as supporting them. And you mentioned BDNF as one of those growth factors that is known to respond to exercise. Exactly. You touched actually, upon this. Yes, yeah, did I miss anything, Mike? Another growth factor that you talked about is, and it's really interesting, I have a student who kind of stumbled upon this because that's what they were interested in, is that we do know muscles make what's called lactate. And our coaches for the last those of you who, who, who do athletics coaches have always said, go for a slow jog and get that lactic acid out of your muscle because it's bad for you. Louis Pasteur just destroyed lactic acid and lactate because of this whole, this, this whole wine thing that he did. But it's bad for wine, but it's good for muscle. Actually, it's lactate. It's not lactic acid. It's lactate. And what we've actually found is that when you exercise, we have this in Animal Models, uh, unpublished paper that's in review. And thank you, boss, being a uh, editor of another journal I can send this to, that in fact, when you exercise, you make lactate. Lactate can go up almost 200 fold in your blood serum. And lactate actually crosses the blood brain barrier. And what it does is actually feed astrocytes and neurons and specifically astrocytes get activated to then directly pump lactate into neurons such that lactate becomes their primary me metabolic molecule for making energy above and beyond glucose and it acting almost as a neurotrophic factor. And we find that in fact, this occurs in a circuit specific fashion with those circuits that are activated by, by, by motor, motor exercise, for example. And so Patrick, you point out that this is something that we never thought of as a neurotrophic factor, but it's feeding neurons and, and, and BDNF and neurotrophic factors are some of them, but lactate is actually another one. And, and there are several others that we're looking at, but lactate is turning out to be an extremely important and interesting molecule and, and something in fact that, that we're targeting in that may be, may be uh, another potential therapeutic target. So is some of the pain in the muscle coming from the lactate in the muscle? Uh, yeah, or just uh, running too far, slow down. You know, so uh, the coach's idea, no pain, no gain? Uh, well, what Maybe the pain true. really is, is again, we, we do encourage patients and Giselle Hetzinger encourages her patients, push a little further than you can every time. Do a little bit more and that's get, in, get out of your comfort zone. And so whether that means another extra kilometer on your trail, a few extra repetitions or on the stationary bike for a little bit longer, these are the types of factors that you're pushing because you're driving, 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 driving the system. And, and when you drive the system, the brain responds to that and, and can in fact create these new circuits. And, and, and this is what we call uh, uh, neuroplasticity. And so exercise. Bas, you've been waving your hand uh, vigorously here, so almost so much that you may have lactate in your arm. But I think you want to say something about a question that came in, I'm guessing, but you may add something else. The notion that we could modify the disease in specific symptoms by using specific exercises, which would hint that Parkinson's then in part would be a rehabable condition. Does that word really exist? But it's sounds not sure if the... from Hugh Johnston, this question. No, I'm not sure if the, uh, if the word rehabable for a non-native speaker is an acceptable term. Uh, it's certainly new to me. No, the, the reason for um, um, waving my hand is that uh, the work that Mike is describing in, in, in mice is, is encouraging and it's exciting and it's insightful. The critique is always a mouse is not a human being. And the one thing I wanted to add is, and that's the, the little perk for all the people that are listening into this presentation is that in addition to the clinical results that we published in the Lancet Neurology three months ago, 
we also did brain scans in the people that were either stretching three times a week or uh, cycling at 80% cardiac output three times a week on a stationary bicycle. And we showed with these imaging results in human beings with Parkinson's that the brain connections got progressively worse in a control group that was just doing stretching as you would expect because Parkinson's is a progressive condition. Whereas the brain was making new connections showing adaptive plasticity, trying to improve itself in much the way that Mike was describing for the rodents, but now in real human beings. So that we're writing this up now, we're sending that also to the Lancet uh, end of this month, uh, but I'm sharing it with the audience because I think it should be a huge, huge motivation for all the folks listening that exercising not only makes you feel better, it actually improves your brain. Could you address this question of progression, which we, we had when we talked about the uh, animal studies and, and say what has been done clinically? And uh, I know it's a very difficult area to research. And can you describe some of those hurdles? And, and could you maybe say something about the role of brain scans in, in trying right. to assess progression? Yeah, so formally speaking, and I want to be very honest as a scientist. So there have now been two studies. One is our own study in the Lancet Neurology. The other one is the beautiful SPARC study by uh, Professor Daniel Korkos um, in the United States, uh, published in JAMA Neurology, also one of our lead journals. Both of those studies showed that engaging in regular exercise helps to stabilize the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. You could interpret that as disease modification or slowing down of the disease progression. But formally speaking, all that you've demonstrated is a symptomatic effect, suppressing the symptoms. Because in order to demonstrate that you did something structurally different by exercising means that if you stop exercising, the exercises, the former exercises are still structurally better than the never exercises. So you need to wash out the treatment in sort of scientific terms. Mm -hmm. That design has been used for drugs that were presumed to be disease modifying in Parkinson's and none of them has been able to show such effects. That design has never been used in the field of exercise. So for all we know is it suppresses symptoms. The rodent work that Mike was talking about and I think our study with imaging as a surrogate outcome as the second best next to showing real disease modification is I think highly encouraging but the Honest answer is that formally we don't know yet whether you can modify the course of Parkinson's. Do you think anybody is about to perform such a study? I know that Professor Daniel Korkos, who is really another leader in this field, uh, is, uh, has just received a large grant of the American NIH uh, to do a new exercise study in the United States where he is going to use dopamine scans as another surrogate outcome measure. So what we used in our study was functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a technique to show a very detailed image of what the brain looks like and how areas are connected. What Professor Korkos is going to do is use dopamine scans, which is very similar to what the work has been done in Los Angeles in the rodents, but now in human beings, to try and show that the rate of decline of cell loss in the substantia nigra is slowed down by exercise. That study is going to start this year, so we'll have to wait for some time for the results to come out. But he will be among the few people that are close to showing real disease modification, I think. So let me just address everybody listening right now. We had a record-breaking number of people register, and I believe record number of people listening in. And we also have a very large number of questions. And we're not going to be able to address all of them, but we decided before the webinar that we tried to collect those questions we didn't address and put them somehow in a web format uh, structured so people can hopefully find the answer there in a few days from now. Karen, you've been waving your hand for a while. You wanted to add something to what was being said just yeah. three minutes ago? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, I think that uh, as somebody that, you know, 10 years ago, started inhaling the research literature that was out there. Um, and so much of it has come in the past decade. 
uh, especially with humans, but really uh, relying on, on work by Michael and others uh, with animals um, to try to assume that there was some translatability. Uh, yeah, I get on my treadmill every morning to like the mice. But um, the early work on exercise uh, and Parkinson's, I mean, it used to be sort of assumed that it wasn't even a very good thing to do unless you do it in a very, very controlled environment with a physical therapist. And so it really came from a, a physical therapy kind of very controlled model where, and again, you'd focus maybe on a specific area of weakness. But I think that now what we've seen when we uh, do a whole body aerobic exercise, I haven't exercised my hand, so where to go, um, but my tremor will be reduced. All right, so you're getting a whole body effect from the general, uh, from the, from the general aerobic effect. So uh, that's not to say that there may not be, we really haven't talked about uh, uh, strength training and anything like that, which also have, certainly has a role, but probably in terms of neuroplasticity, less of a role. Um, but that certainly can, you know, strengthen certain weak areas. Um, there's balance training also. There are other specific interventions for specific problems, but I think mostly we're focused on the neuroplastic effects of, of, of hard aerobic exercise, which really has an overall whole body effect. So I think you're all getting a sense that there could be multiple beneficial effects of exercise, but we don't fully understand uh, the total impact of exercise and Parkinson's disease. And a lot of the questions are more personal that we're getting now. And I'd like to ask Karen, if you could help us to respond to uh, the question, I can't get my rhythm going uh, after taking meds. Any advice or explanation? So this is a person who also exercises early in the morning before food, uh, but after taking meds doesn't seem to be able to, to uh, do the exercise. And, could there be any yeah. advice or explanation? And I think it's related to another question right next to this one. What is the role of the on, off, on and off phases in planning exercise in Parkinson's? So these are really interesting questions. What do you right. think, Karen? Well, I don't, you know, I don't see those questions, unfortunately, but I will say that I no longer have off periods. So it's hard for me to respond to that, which is unbelievable considering how I was the first couple of years. But I would assume that you know, one would need to exercise um, in their optimal state, which would be in an on state. I couldn't imagine exercising in an off state. I think it would be very dangerous. Not that I haven't pulled off the treadmill a few times, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, but uh, it's still worth it. Um, but um, in terms of getting going, I think, look, if, if I can, I'd like to broaden that question a little bit, which is, there are a lot of folks out there who want to exercise, but are finding it extremely difficult to develop a regular exercise routine. And I think that that's a really important issue to address, whether it's because the meds aren't kicking in, whether in the morning when you want to exercise, it just takes you a lot, it takes me uh, a much longer time until my meds kick in in the morning to really get moving. What, what I do, um, which has worked for me, which I recommend for other people, is try to anticipate and work around obstacles that are likely to present. In other words, the day before, when I'm on, when I'm energetic still, I will make sure I set up my clothing for running, that I have everything set up in advance. And if I think about, for somebody who doesn't yet exercise regularly, but is trying to develop a habit in terms of habit formation, which is a really important concept here, um, and it's not easy to develop a habit for anybody, all right? It's not a question of willpower. I drop that concept of willpower, motivation. It's really, you know, yeah, there might be some temperament involved, but it really is a question of planning, okay? And, and looking at it as a problem to be solved, what are the things that for me interfere with my ability to perform an activity on a regular basis? And let me problem solve that. That's the way that I've approached it. 
And what are those, if it's, you know, I'm too tired in the morning to, and it, I'm too slow. Well, I make sure that everything is ready, that my coffee is prepared the night before, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that everything, everything and the clothes are right there at, so that I only have time to think about not exercising, which is why I do it seven days a week, so I can't have a day off, all right? So I think, think for yourself about what those obstacles are and brainstorm how you can work around those. And they may be different for every single person, all right? But for me, that is the key to developing a habit in any aspect of your life. Problem solve what the obstacles are to developing that activity on a regular basis. I think those are great words, and I think they apply to people who are not affected by Parkinson's disease. And as a father <laughs> of a, <laughs> uh, young sons in our family who are great soccer players and love to do soccer practice, but one of their major hurdles is finding their outfit just before soccer practice. And preparation is key to, be a, to have habits, I think. So a very, very good statement. And it's, of course, it's easier said than done. Yeah, Patrick, just uh, uh, and Patrick and Karen, you raise important issues of motivation. Of course, it's a problem with everybody. But one thing that we found, and this is uh, Giselle and, and a few other people and their, their groups, <clears throat> is, and someone already, uh, Boss, raised the issue also, is this whole idea of social groups, social uh, support. We do know that, in fact, and this is the problem in clinical design, is that you think you're going to just make a, a control group, a non-intervention group, as your social group. And it turns out that the social group can have as much impact on the brain as an exercise group. And it's not necessarily just the placebo effect, which we, we, but we do know that in, that in fact this is a, a intervention or something the brain is experiencing. The other thing that's really, really important, and I think for patients, is try to identify a group of people that you can actually exercise with. We have a 5K group that meets every Thursday. Uh, there's another group that does dance and lifestyle changes every, twice a week. Um, and some of these groups are big, anywhere from 10 to 120 people. Um, and this is extremely important because it can be motivating. It can also in, bring in the whole idea of social interactions, which we know is fundamentally important to brain health and, and, and begin to actually be uh, force you or at least begin to make uh, exercise or physical physical activity as part of your lifestyle, your your daily uh, regimen, for example. And that's extremely important. So those so of you Michael, who are- Michael, I really appreciate you bringing that up because Andrew Casey posted that, or Cassie, Andrew Cassie yeah. posted that question. How much of the social benefits from exercise contribute to the positive effects on symptoms? Huge. I think it's a wonderful question. And yeah. you say huge. And if you want that in kilocalories per gram protein <laughs> brain, I can send you that paper. So. so there are effects on metabolism, on brain plasticity, and there are also effects yeah. and the other, the other that are that, more difficult to pin down in terms of social well-being. Yeah, and Karen brought up another point about gut. There's been a lot of work on the microbiome or what we call the microbiota, and that does change hourly and that changes daily we have no idea if someone says that they they can tell you the key to this they're lying to you we don't know what any of it means but we do know that a healthy microbiome a microbiota is fundamental to parkinson's disease as well as lifestyle and just general health there was a paper a few months ago that showed that up to 60 to 70 percent of the dopamine that one can ingest is actually destroyed or metabolized by gut microbiome mm -hmm. and doesn't get into the brain. But that changes with exercise and, and, and healthy lifestyle and diet and a number of those factors are extremely important to re maintain the healthy biota. And if your gut feels good, like Karen pointed out, you feel like going for a walk or going for a run. When you're constipated and the threat of having to be close to a toilet is gonna keep you away from, from going out on a social group or going out for a walk or a hike, fundamentally important, as well as interfering with dopamine's eff efficacy too. So that's another important point. So I have lots of hands waving and I have also a specific question for Bass. One is, uh, you mentioned an app. Can you say what the app is called? It was mentioned by Professor Bass. And also I'd, I would like to ask Bass a little bit about remotely supervised exercise in general. We heard from Karen the importance of being prepared and planning and making it into a habit, but are there ways of helping people who are not so good at planning their lives and making habits? Yep. 
So the app was designed for the trial and we've had lots and lots of questions about it. It was developed by the gaming industry and essentially it tapped into two things. One is, is the reward system. It rewarded people for exercising and it rewarded people after the exercise. Uh, it also rewarded people during the exercise. And that part is something people can use even today. So for example, cycling on a stationary bicycle can be boring to some at least. Um, if you do that while you're playing the Pac-Man game on the screen in front of you and the monsters start to run faster and faster and you need to cycle harder and harder to kill the monsters. In the end, you think you've killed 20 monsters, but in effect, you've exercised at 80% of your maximum heart rate for 45 minutes. So the essence of the, of, the, of the app was to gamify the intervention, to add an extra layer of fun. Some of us just are rewarded by the exercise itself. Some of people need an additional extra reward for their exercise. So this is something to cleverly think about. The person who said, I can't find my rhythm in the morning, I would say, always try to exercise when you are in an on state, take some extra medication if needed, and consider trying your exercise first with a physiotherapist who may try to work out what sort of exercise suits you best. I'm a strong believer in physiotherapists. The therapist shouldn't be there for all of your exercises. You do that by yourself. But maybe the first time or the first two or three times, try and find something that fits you best. Um, and then what was the second part of the question, Patrick? So you mentioned, I think you really addressed it. It was this idea of uh, remotely supervising right. the exercise. I mean, th this is not really supervising it, it's having the app do it, but perhaps you can add the idea that there is a person at the other end of the device right. that is motivating yep. people. Right, exactly. So um, in our study, we had a coach who remotely supervised people, basically just tracking whether you were exercising yes or no. And if you failed to comply with your regular exercise, somebody would ring you up. That person could be your spouse, it could be a cousin, it could be a neighbor, it could be a friend. But if you engage other people into your regular habit of exercising, and they become the gatekeepers of your regular exercise. It adds that layer of social pressure and control to the exercise. The one thing I wanted to add, Patrick, is the issue of safety, uh, which is something that we need to think about. So in our study, we chose for a stationary bicycle for two reasons. One is you cannot fall off the bicycle. And if we had delivered treadmills to the patient's homes, then of course it adds an element of unsafety because you can stumble and fall off the treadmill. Mm -hmm. And people with freezing of gait, people with balance abnormalities are at risk of falling. So again, that's a reason to find an exercise that is not only palatable, but also safe. And cycling is the ultimate exercise for people with Parkinson's. That's what because, a Dutchman would say, of course. Uh, obviously, but there is some science behind it because even people grounded by freezing of gait when the feet are glued and stuck to the floor, can still ride their bicycles, oftentimes effortlessly. So cycling is a good and safe intervention. The other thing is, we know from a variety of studies that people with Parkinson's, in part because they don't exercise as much as they should, have a higher risk of cardiovascular complications. So in our study, all patients were screened by a physician for cardiac fitness, heart fitness, before they exercised, because there is a theoretical risk of sustaining myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, um, if you exercise. That risk, I think, is very small. It is definitely not something I'm saying to frighten people at the other end of the line, but to have somebody look at your cardiac fitness before you engage in strenuous exercise might be a good thing to do. So, Bas, uh, I'm going to hand over to Karen in a second, but I just got a question from a fellow Dutch woman, Mariette Robin, I believe is Dutch. Uh, and yep. she asks, how about measuring progress of fitness, et cetera, as a motivator, uh, as opposed to how many monsters you killed? Yeah, Marietta is a wonderful lady. Uh, hi, Marietta. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that excellent question. You should follow her on Twitter. She's a very fresh and critical mind. No, I think that's excellent. We, we actually tracked fitness as an outcome measure in our study in the Lancet Neurology. It got significantly better. And you're absolutely right. I use that myself when I exercise in the gym. I track my own fitness and I use that as a self-motivator to keep track of myself. It could be distance traveled, 
It could be the time on your regular lab. It could be um, objective parameters of heart rate and oxygen consumption. So it's a very good point uh, using objective measures of fitness or performance as a motivator is excellent and a very good suggestion. Thank you. So before I hand to Karen, I'm just going to uh, share an anecdote I've heard. I don't know if it's true, but once all those wearable devices that we have that measure how many steps we take uh, emerged on the market and people were wearing them, people living in apartment blocks uh, got disturbed around 9, 10 p.m. by noise from their neighbors because suddenly somebody saw they hadn't done all the steps they needed to do and they didn't want to go outside in the cold. So be walking back and forth, back and forth in their apartments. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard it's true. All right, Karen. Yeah, I, I think that we do need to address the issue, not, not just of, you know, um, of, of cardiac risk, but in general risk of injury. And that I do not, uh, although you have to figure out what works for you because not what, what works for my neighbor who has Parkinson's may not be what works for me. I do not exercise in a group despite the wonderful social aspects, not because I'm asocial, but because I'm too competitive. And I cannot risk injuring myself. And I've spoken to people who have had, uh, actually here's a quick anecdote, a guy who uh, had ex took Xenotide uh, and got it off label as well as exercised regularly. He injured himself, couldn't exercise, that made more of a difference to him. Um, and so, so the, what is really important, I don't, I don't ever, everybody would see me running on the treadmill every morning and they'd say, well, what are you training for the marathon? And I'd say, oh, no, no, I'd never do that because I'm too competitive. And I would push myself harder and not listen to my body. And as, as a Dr. Uh, Jakovic mentioned that, you know, in terms of the cognitive awareness, my effort goes into watching my cadence, all right, altering my cadence. Um, and just as we know, and, and that alteration itself is really important. But I also have a routine every day of rolling out with a foam roller, changing the shoes that I wear, doing all these things that I figured out that worked for me to decrease my risk of injury. So you might speak to, um, an exercise uh, expert or a physical therapist to figure out what you need to do to decrease your risk of injury. And whether you're talking about people who are intensively exercising or just starting out, you still have a risk of injury. And if once you're injured, then you're out of the game. So you wanna be able to benefit yourself, uh, engage in uh, activities as much as you can for as long as you can. And if you injure yourself, you can't. So I just caution people to think about that when you're planning any kind of regimen of, of physical activity. So on that topic almost, uh, Omatola Thomas asked, uh, I'm not sure if I missed it, but in terms of intensity, is there an average target heart rate we should be aiming for? And of course the answer is, uh, depending on your age, it'll be different. Depending on your level of fitness, of course, it would be different. I see, Karen, you're shaking your head, so one can't give a number there, mm -hmm. but we've talked about the importance of a certain level of intensity. So uh, twiddling your thumbs in your sofa at home isn't enough exercise. But we can't give a number to Omatola, is that correct? Karen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, yeah, we can't give a number, but you really want to make sure that you, I mean, you ideally want to be able to reach a level in which you're breaking a sweat. You may not be able to start it out there. All right. But something is better than nothing. All right. If you are sedentary, start with either walking or walking with a walker or whatever you can do or getting on a recumbent bike. All right. Somebody so also asked another question, because I see we're running out of time. I just want to fit in one quick one there. Somebody said in more advanced stages of disease, are there benefits there too? And I think you're hinting that one can find ways to exercise even when severely affected by disease. Yeah, I, I think the evidence supports that. Yeah, there's, there's, there's evidence from, if you, if you get out of the Parkinson's field and get into the Alzheimer's, get into cognitive impairment and dementia, there's been a lot of literature on showing that in fact, 
there is benefit to exercise no matter what you do, no matter when you start it. That's not a hypothesis. That is That's a, a great way to end the whole webinar. Exactly. So and I, I think uh, yeah. we all should feel that. Oh, I think Bas wants to say one more thing. Yeah. He got a question from Jens. Um, yes. To, to, why to don't very... doctors prescribe exercise? You have 10 seconds to answer that difficult question. They need evidence. So fortunately, the evidence is accumulating. If you register a drug, you need evidence about dose, side effects, intensity, duration. That evidence is beginning to accumulate. Doctors are resilient to change. They think drugs is everything. Exercise, we are near the time that doctors should take their prescription notes and write a dose of exercise because we now have the evidence in place. You're absolutely right, Jens. This is all undisputed evidence but we now need to persuade the doctors, but they needed the evidence, but they can no longer hide the evidence is out there now. And although I have not been exercising, my heart rate is going up because we're running out of time and I think is a great way to end this. Uh, patients are leading the development here. Exercise is important. The medical research world is catching up and the clinicians will be prescribing exercise five or 10 years from now, that's my prediction. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope to answer some of your questions. And bye-bye from all of us. Bye. Thank you.